All right, um, I'm going to go and start. Um, yes, yeah, so what we're in um, our week three here, or well, our unit three, I should say. Um, so this is usually for review for our test uh, questions and stuff. So I had one or two things that I'd go over, uh, thought, thought I might go over. Um, I did get back the program assignment three. Um, so maybe I didn't have a lot to say about that, so, but maybe I'll bring that up uh, first a little bit quickly. Um, and then I, I wanted to talk maybe a little bit about in, in the session here um, um, about the dining philosophers problem, because sometimes there's, I, use a, I use that for questions on the, um, the test. So. I thought I might discuss that and then see if there's other stuff anybody has questions about or, or um, wants to review or anything like that. Um, uh, I don't know if we've got anybody joining online yet. Um, yeah. um, okay, let's. Let me go ahead and um, set this up. Um, bring up the example solution here for the third program. Let's open, let's close this one off. Open up the solution here. So, I was just going to talk maybe about kind of the most common problems that people had. Um, most everybody that um, um, submitted something had the first three functions, the first three tasks, pretty much working. So, so we're, we're passing all those things. So, um, you know, the needs are met. Uh, find candidate process and the uh, the release allocated resources. Um, I think I didn't see too much of a difference on how people did those. So the 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 only, only place where some people had some bugs were was the is safe function. So the final one, bringing it all together. So I'll just mention a couple of those. So probably the most common uh, two or three submissions, um, including at least two groups. Um, weren't uh, initializing this, uh, the, the one or both of these matrices correctly. Right? If, you didn't, if you didn't copy over the current available, then um, uh, of course it was more immediately obvious that there was a, a problem. So, um, so I think everybody was copying over the current available, but uh, a few people weren't initializing this. So for example, if you just declare your array of booleans, which is supposed to be keeping track of which processes have run or been marked for the banker's algorithm or not. Um, uh, the, the, the problem with this is that it, it might seem to work because a lot of the times memory is gonna be zeroed out uh, when you're going into a new function. And, and when you declare a variable local like this to a function, it's actually declared, uh, you know, it's actually created on the function call stack Right, so, so this will often be zero, but not always. So, so if you're not initializing this, you're not guaranteed that it'll be zero. So, um, so yeah, if, 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 if you weren't setting those to be false, um, you might have gotten the, the test to be right. I don't know if I'll be able to reproduce this or not, um, but um, 
build here. Um, when you run the tests, um, yeah, you might get a, a pass, but as some people found out, if you try and run the um, system tests, um, uh, it, it may fail. So the system tests are, are more likely to end up with getting stuff on the stack um, so that you don't have all zero variables, uh, so you don't end up getting this initialized if you're not explicitly initialized. This, this is kind of a, I don't know, I, I, I did want to discuss this a little bit. I mean, this is a, a common mistake to make, but it's um, 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 a little bit surprised that the compiler doesn't uh, detect this. So, so there's some things that a compiler can detect if you're trying to use a variable that you haven't initialized, right? But it, it's almost always an error to try and read a value out of, 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 of a variable that you haven't initialized, right? So, so if, you know, if you don't initialize completed, but then you're going in here and using them, um, it's probably so in our basic task is that we are using that we're reading it back out when, for example, when we do find candidate process, right? So those really need to be all false. They, they all need to, all the process need to be marked as not completed yet before you start doing things. Um, so I don't know if this will, so, so yeah, you'll get random different things failing, even though you get all the unit tests to pass if you don't initialize this. Um, um, so anyway, that's kind of a, this kind of a C thing. So you can actually initialize. And if you only specify one value, it actually, for an array, it actually does copy that value to all the things. Um, although, you know, if you want to be more explicit, you can always do a loop there, so. In this case, we can do something like so. So completed has is the size of, or you know, it should have a value for each process um, in our simulation that we're running. So I don't really need to, to, to implement all to, to to initialize all the up to match processes. I just need to initialize for the current number of processes in my simulation that's running right now. So, um, uh, there. That's another way you can do it a little bit more explicitly. So, um, it should run, but it should also um, actually pass the system test as well. So, usually, unless you have some other problem, but, but right, so you'll get the system pass to pass there. So. Uh, so that was one a couple people made. Uh, some people, I mean, this wasn't an, an error. Uh, it's just a little bit annoying uh, to me that, that um, some people were hard coding this loop. So uh, if you, If you run this loop uh, a set number of times, so, so you, you know that at most this loop has to run one, you know, if you've got five processes, the loop has to run at most five times to mark each of the five processes, right? It might not have to run that many because it could be that you get to a point uh, where there's no more candidates. And so, so, I mean, it could even be that, you, that the loop doesn't have to run at all because the, the, the state at the beginning, there's no no process that's a candidate given the current available resources, right? So, so the loop can run as, as little as zero times or need, need to be run as little as zero times or as many as up to however many no processes you have in the simulation, right? But um, so it's actually, you know, the, the, the code will work if you just hard code it to run uh, a fixed number of times uh, as long as you're being careful. So in this case, um, um, 
So I, I, I removed the, the, the part of the while loop here, but, but yeah, this will run a fixed number of times, you know, so if I have five processes that are run five times, it's just that, you know, if there's no candidate, the, the loop will be running unnecessarily, right? So whenever, whenever there's no candidate, if, if we get to the point, like after two processes run, but then the last three um, aren't candidates and the system's not safe, uh, in that case, the, the, the loop would continue running, but we just wouldn't end up going inside the if part and releasing, you know, finding a candidate and releasing the um, um, resources for it. Um, um, so not a big deal, except like in a real system, it can be very expensive to be calling like the find candidate uh, and other things. So, um, so running this unnecessarily is, is, is just a, more of a, um, um, a performance issue than, um, um, than a bug. So. So, you know, aesthetically, the best thing to do is to have uh, something like a while loop that will terminate as soon as you detect that there's no candidate, right? So there's lots of ways you can construct that. So in the example solution, you know, we, we, we find the candidate process um, and then we use a, a separate variable to control the, 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 the loop, um, you know. So another common thing was um, people are using just an infinite loop um, and then if, if you ever detect there's no candidate breaking out, um, that's also fine. I tend to, personally, I tend not to like overusing break in order to kind of, um, um, you know, uh, get out of the normal flow of, of a loop like that. And sometimes that's the easiest thing to do, the, the most uh, clear thing to do, you know, but um, in this case, this example solution is, is kind of like, A little bit more like the pseudocode from the textbook. So we 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 de define something uh, which is a variable called possible here, um, which is true as long as there's still possible candidates, and it becomes false as, as soon as that there's no possible candidates left, um, which was what our textbook pseudocode for the is safe named the uh, the, the variable that it used. Um, call it possible or something like that. So like possible candidates. Um, all right, so yeah, I think that was kind of all I was gonna mention. Um, there's an example solution post up there if anybody is interested um, um, to look at the possible alternatives. Um, but, but I did see a lot of, um, I mean, there's they're not, not fundamentally different things you can do here, but, but you know, a lot of different um, ways of constructing the while loop that people did and stuff that were all working or mostly working fine for most people. So. And and yeah, and and then kind of just maybe to wrap it up. I mean, at the end, you do have to do a final kind of thing, um, which again, everybody except for I think there was one somebody had a bug here doing something not quite right just on the final thing. But um, but, but yeah, you have to go through and, and check. And if you have any any processes that aren't completed, you should be returning false from the. Um, um, is safe, um, but otherwise, if they're all completed, um, the answer should be true that, that the state is safe. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so that was assignment three, but um, um, I think as I've mentioned, you know, there, there will be some questions where you have to do banker's algorithm and or the deadlock detection. Um, so, you know, so it's good to, re to review this. Um, so, so hopefully people are, have a better understanding of what the banker's algorithm is doing from, from implementing uh, things like this, right? So, so from, from to actually implement the code um, step by step here. Uh, all right.
so um So at this point, um, you know, hopefully everybody's kind of familiar with the format of the tests, kind of know what to expect here. Um, uh, it's the same format as before, um, and there is a, um, a, a separate folder if you want to do handwritten work for the, the two or three short answer questions that they'll be uh, on the test. So there is some review material. Um, I'll look through real quickly here, maybe. Uh, you know, maybe the, um, the example short problems might be good things, you know, so if you saw something like that, make certain you know. So, so I mentioned this before, um, 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 there's likely to be where I'll give you a state of a system and ask you to draw resource allocation graphs. So be, be, be sure you can do that. We had an example of that last, uh, last meeting or the week ago, maybe, um, when we were talking about the um, uh, bankers algorithm a bit. Um, execute the banker's algorithm by hand, uh, execute the deadlock detection algorithm by hand. Um, um, for things that people probably should review. Um, make certain that you um, kind of review the necessary and sufficient conditions for deadlocks. Right, um, and, and and don't forget the, the 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 first of the three there. So there's there's three different methods that we talked about for dealing with deadlocks in typical operating systems. So avoidance, uh, detection, and uh, prevention. Right. So you know the the avoidance is the the banker's algorithm or the um, resource allocation denial or the um, um, process initiation denial. So there's kind of two versions of that one. Um, deadlock detection, I did talk a little bit about. So, so that's where you just allow the system to run um, and you don't do anything necessary to try and keep deadlocks from occurring. But after the fact, maybe periodically you run, you, you just to see if there's a deadlock right now in the system or not, and then maybe do something after it's formed. Right? So, but um, you can also do prevent deadlocks from being able to occur in the first place. Um, so to do that, you have to um, remove one of those four conditions that we talked about, the necessary and sufficient conditions. So um, um, yeah, that was the, the no preemption, the hold and wait, um, or the, um, um, the, the, the first one is, is one that you can't normally remove. So that, that's the, the one uh, where you have to have um, um, uh, you know, a locking mechanism. So, you know, the, the, where, where you keep things from uh, being able to interfere with each other, right? Um, and then the fourth condition, though, was, was really that, so, so, so the first three are kind of necessary condi conditions, but, but even if you have those three, you don't, you're not necessarily going to have a deadlock form in the system. So you only get a deadlock once you get this, as our textbook describes it, as a, a circular weight, so a chain of uh, locks and pending requests to lock a resource um, so that no process that's in the deadlock can um, carry on from that point. Um, there will be questions about, um, you know, uh, semaphores uh, and maybe monitors and stuff. So, I mean, there could be, even be a short answer question on those. So, um, you, know, you ought to know kind of what the, for example, what the, um, um, how the semaphore works, what, what were the two main functions for it? So, like the signal and weight, um, as it's normally called for a semaphore, or, or the things that actually lock and unlock the semaphore. Um, and also, you know, you ought to understand the um, the hardware part of, of the, the chapter five as well, right? So, so, so the, the 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 semaphores, the monitors, and the other things that we talked about are really software mechanisms that the operating system implements to give uh, mechanisms for mutual exclusion. So, so that that, that was the first condition. Our, our textbook calls that the mutual exclusion condition. So, 
Um, so um, these software-based mechanisms solve some of the, some problems that the hardware um, mechanisms uh, can't solve. So it's the the main one that the the you know, I talked about some of this in the um, uh, lecture videos for this week or this unit. Um, so the main one is that um, uh, by using the concept of the process in the operating system, we don't have to do busy waiting to implement mutual exclusion if uh, you know if, if we implement these at the software level, like a semaphore, right? So, so we can avoid having to have like a, a tight, busy loop that's continually checking, you know, is the lock available? No, is the lock available? No, until it becomes available, right? So, um, and that relies on putting the process to sleep, so blocking it, uh, when it's trying to acquire a lock and then unblocking a process when the lock becomes available. So keeping like a list or something of the processes that are blocked, waiting on it and, and then unblocking it. So instead of doing busy waiting, you're using the operating systems um, um, state transition mechanism you know, to, to block and unblock the processes waiting on resources. Um, but, but that you really have to do that at the operating system level Right, so um, um, uh, so there there are hardware based mechanisms for mutual exclusion. So these come down to that. There's going to usually be at least one instruction that the CPU provides in order to implement mutual exclusion. So things like semaphores and monitors and whatever at the operating system level, they rely on this instruction. There has to be an atomic instruction. Um, that can basically do sort of like a read and and uh, um, uh, and a compare at the same time, economically. If you don't have that, you can't easily implement mutual exclusion just with regular like load and store instructions, right? So, um, so anyway, that, that was brought up in chapter five. So like, you know, Intel CPU actually has two, um, special instructions, the compare and swap and the um, exchange instruction. Um, um, all right, so anyway, that's, that's all the, the review material that was up there. Um, Like I mentioned, there was one, one more thing I thought I might talk about a bit because I sometimes have a question about um, the uh, um, dying philosopher's problem and, and some of the last, the, the end material for chapter six. Um, let's bring up the figure for that. So. Um, so, sorry, um, the there's there's a, I can't remember exactly where it is, but um, um, there's some examples of using. Oh, it's probably back in chapter five. Um, so, um, this would have been also some good stuff. Uh, I mean, there'll, there'll be some questions on these, um, but, um, for example, there, there's some examples in chapter five of, of using the mutual exclusion mechanisms like a semaphore in order to solve some common problems, some common concurrency problems like the reader writers, readers uh, and writers problem. Right. So, um, um, uh, just to jump back to this, um, uh, in this case, so this is a common thing that we have to do um, when we're writing software um, is that um, if we're writing um, a distributed system where we have multiple uh, uh, things that are uh, cooperating with each other on a task, um, often we have some things that are producing data, so that are creating the data. So those are kind of like the, the, the writers. And then we have other things that are consuming the data. Okay, so that, that's, that's the general kind of split between the, the, the readers and writers in this problem here. Um, and then the most general 
um, version of the problem. We can have multiple readers and multiple writers, right? So, um, so the problem is, is that um, um, often both of these need to be storing the data in a shared resource, okay? So anytime you have a shared resource, if you have things acting concurrently that want to access the data on the shared resource, you have concurrency issues, right? So, so, so normally we have to use a mutual exclusion mechanism in order to protect the uh, shared resource. So uh, in, in this section from our textbook, uh, we use a, we think of it as some sort of like a, a queue or a, a buffer that um, uh, writers are writing data onto the buffer and, and readers are, are reading data from it. Um, But um, uh, so you know, so there are just some examples of, of using uh, semaphores in here for um, solving that. Um, so so actually, yeah. So, so I kind of skipped over that. There's actually a, um, a, a simpler um, problem, the producer-consumer problem, which is also talked a little bit about. So that's a little bit easier to understand. Um, how you um, um, might use semaphores or some sort of mutual exclusion mechanism to do producer consumer to, to solve the concurrency issues on, on, um, on that one. So in that one, it's simpler because uh, I thought there was like a, um, what I'm looking for here was, um, all the way back up at the beginning of the semaphore section here. So um, in that one, we just, um, you know, so at, at the simplest, we can think of one producer and one consumer. So, so it's kind of like the reader writer problem, but um, but we usually think of it as it's just one, but uh, one of each, but they're both putting data into a shared buffer, right? So it's a little bit more concrete than the reader writer problem. So the, the producer needs to be adding items into the buffer um, and the consumer needs to be taking things out, right? So um, the main problem is, is that um, um, in a real world situation, um, our buffer is gonna be finite. Um, so, so that means it's, it's of some fixed size, right? So, uh, so we have two different problems. Either the buffer could be empty, in which case, if the consumer wants to run, but there's no items, it needs to, to block and wait until some items are in the buffer, right? But, but likewise, the, the buffer could end up becoming full. So if the buffer's full, um, the producer needs to be blocked um, until there's some room for it to run again and put some more items into the buffer. So, um, So that's that's the more general case. And to solve that, you really need kind of two semaphores that are going to end up acting as uh, a communication mechanism. Um, so so the two are basically because you need, uh, or actually you end up need three in the solution that's given in the textbook. So one just just works straightforwardly as like a lock or an unlock. So that's what the S does here. So um, in this solution for the producer consumer. Um, before we call append or take to access the shared buffer, we, we first have to wait on S, which is uh, get the lock on S. And then once we're done getting the value from the, the, the buffer or um, you know, putting the value in the buffer or getting the value out of the buffer, um, we signal the S to unlock, right? So it's basically just a, a S lock and unlock around accessing the buffer here. So S acts straightforwardly like a lock, right? But we use semaphores uh, in this solution for the producer consumer um, also to signal the empty and the full condition. So the N keeps track of, of, of the buffer being full um, and E is used to, to keep track of the buffer being empty. 
right? So E starts off um, initially as the size of the buffer because when it gets down to zero, that's when you want the um, um, producer to block, right? So, so the producer waits on E empty. Um, and, and if it is empty, it's gonna get blocked at that point, right? Um, and the, uh, the um, or sorry, the, the, the um, um, all that backwards. So, um, so the producer waits on E, um, which is really, I guess E is not a good name because I was thinking E meant empty, but um, uh, this really keeps track of when um, there's no room left in the buffer here. So that's why the producer is waiting on E. Um, so as long as, as E doesn't block, um, that means that there's still some room. So the producer is safe to go ahead and try to pin another item in here. Um, and you'll notice then the consumer basically after it takes an item signals E um, in order to um, um, remove an item. So we're using a counting semaphore in this example here. Um, so for the signaling E that reduces the, the, um, the, the value on the semaphore by one. And thus we kind of keep track of indirectly the number of items on the buffer here. And the reverse happens for the other semaphore, but this one starts off at zero because initially the, the buffer is empty. So for example, if the consumer ran first when the buffer was initially empty, um, it, sh it should block immediately. Um, so, so yeah, the consumer waits on in, um, which would cause it to block and in should cause um, somebody waiting on it to block anytime the buffer is, is empty here, um, like it would do if the consumer happened to run first. Um, anyway, that, so that was a little bit of an aside because I was going to talk about the dining philosophers problem because, you know, so these are examples of using the mutual exclusion mechanisms for um, um, managing concurrency, right? So concurrency, like, like this producer-consumer problem illustrates uh, concurrency, there's more than one thing. That, that you might need to do with a concurrency mechanism. So, so there is the locking and unlocking in order to define a critical section, but also concurrency mechanisms um, are used to uh, synchronize. Um, you know, uh, when, when, when two or more things are cooperating, they might have to synchronize their actions, right? So that's really what the N and the E are doing here for the producer consumer. Uh, example, um, these allow them to synchronize their actions, um, so to keep track of when the buffer's full or empty and, and keep them from you know, reading or writing when they shouldn't be. Um, So uh, back to the dining philosophers problem. Uh, so this is commonly used as um, a test of a concurrency mechanism, right? So, so if you're um, trying to see if your mutual exclusion mechanism works correctly or not, you might set up a dining philosophers problem um, to, um, uh, to test it out, right? So, so the basic setup is we've, we've got multiple processes, or multiple people eating in this case, um, and we've got shared resources, but we got we got uh, shared resources that that are shared between two. Each resource is potentially shared between two processes uh, in this case, right? So each fork is shared between two adjacent diners here. Um, and the, cons the constraint is, is that uh, in order to uh, actually work, you have to have both of the resources, right? So basically for, for one person to eat, they have to have both their left and right fork. If they have both their forks, then they can get some, some food and, and eat it, right? If they've only got one fork um, or, no, or no forks, they have to wait um, until they, they get both their forks before they can start working on their problem. So um, 
So the, the, the basic problem here is that deadlock is a potential um, um, and potentially happen, you know, so, so the easiest way to imagine this is just imagine, you know, in this case, we've got what, uh, five um, processes here. So five processes numbered zero through four um, or five philosophers. Um, so if, if all of them sit down and, and if all of them have a similar set of code where they always first acquire the left fork, let's say, and then acquire the right fork. And if, if we get into a situation where we're unlucky, where each process runs and acquires only one of their two resources and gets interrupted, um, um, and, and then we go around to do that. So, so P0 grabs its left fork, P1 grabs its left fork, P2 grabs its left fork, P3 and P4. And then if we're at that situation, we're deadlocked because all of them have one fork. And if we don't have any preemption, have some way of forcing them to put the fork down, uh, they've, they've all got the one fork, uh, but um, their neighbor has the other fork um, and they can't eat uh, without being the second resource. Um, and if we don't break one of those necessary su sufficient conditions like preemption, so forcing one of them to put the fork down um, or the hold and wait, right? So at this point, they've, they've all locked one of the resources, they're, they're holding it and waiting on um, their second resource um, to occur um, before they proceed here. Um, so with a little bit of thought, it's, it's obvious that um, deadlocks uh, can occur here, right? Um, so, you know, the, the question discussed in our textbook is, so how would we um, modify the, the, the problem or how would we set it up um, in order to uh, be able to prevent deadlocks using a mutual exclusion mechanism? Right. So, um, and, and usually, you know, we're not asking for, you know, kind of silly solutions like, um, well, you know, uh, just put like an extra fork on there or things like that, you know. So, 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 you know, within the constraints of the problem where, you know, we're basically laid out in the same way and deadlocks are potential. Can we do something to add in like an additional um, mutual exclusion mechanism um, in order to guarantee that deadlocks? Uh, won't occur here, right? Um, so a common idea is something like this. Um, so instead of allowing all the processes um, to be at the table, so to speak, at the same time, so, so in, 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 if we think of this as like a computing system, um, processes have two different states, right? So either at the table or waiting to get admitted to the table, right? So in that case, if we add in that additional kind of mechanism, um, we can have um, like an attendance, like is discussed here, that would only allow in minus one process at the table at any given time, right? So again, it should be obvious why that works. So if I have five forks, but I only allow at, at most four uh, um, eaters, four, four processes at the table, there's always gonna be one of the four um, that's gonna be able to get both of its forks, right? So let's say, let's say process zero is not at the table here. So let, let, let's go to the same situation I talked about again here. So if process zero is not at the table, he's not gonna pick up its left fork. But process one would have this fork, process two would have this fork, process three would have this fork, process four would have this fork, right? Now at that point, we're not deadlocked though because process four's right fork, since there's no process zero here, is still available, right? So, so, so if we limit so that at most it can be in minus one processes um, waiting to get resources, at least one process is gonna be able to get the second fork, do some work, and then it can put down its forks. Um, and then, you know, either it's going to continue eating or at some point it'll be done with its work and it will leave the table, which would guarantee that one of the other processes then could make some progress or we could admit another process then um, and allow it to do some work, right? But that's, that's the basic thing kind of being discussed here. But, um, but this is a little bit different from the, you know, the, 
the, the, the producer consumer or the reader writers, okay? Because here we are explicitly using a mutual exclusion mechanism um, to, to um, um, address deadlocks um, in the system. So, so before we were just using them in order to keep from interference from happening on the shared resource for producer consumers and also to synchronize, you know, to make certain that producers aren't trying to write into a full buffer, that kind of thing. Okay? So here we're, we're showing another example of what you can do with a mutual exclusion mechanism. So, so here we can, we can potentially build a mechanism to prevent deadlocks in, in this kind of constraint problem here. So we, we don't remove any of the necessary and sufficient conditions. So we're still allowing hold and wait. Um, uh, we're still not requiring preemption to occur, right? But by, by setting this up, we can guarantee that, that deadlocks um, won't occur here, right? So, um, So, um, oh, the, the, yeah, so, so there was an example solution using a monitor here instead of a semaphore. So a monitor is another um, type of mutual exclusion mechanism that some operating systems um, you might find some places. I don't think it's as common as it used to be. Um, although a monitor is more like an object-oriented kind of approach to building a mutual exclusion mechanism where a semaphore is more like a straightforward, just a, <laughs> a set of functions that you call, um, you know, signal and wait. So for a monitor, basically, you can think of a monitor as like a um, as like an object that you have to to enter into it in order to get a lock on the monitor. Um, so. Um, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, so actually, it did kind of discuss. It discussed also using a semaphore. So I'm, I'm wrong about that. But it gave an example using monitor as well. So, so yeah, for the monitor, you can kind of think of it as like an object uh, that you enter into. But yeah, so let's let's go back kind of to the. Um, The, the two things that are given in our textbook here, um, the first one is actually, you know, a, a deadlock um, actually um, um, can potentially occur here because all the processes are waiting on one fork and the other fork here. So, so they're waiting on, on, you know, so if it's process zero, they're first waiting on fork zero and then, and then you know, we can think of it as the left fork and then on fork one, right? So you have to, you have to get both of those um, and after you get the first one, you're going to be holding it uh, and then potentially waiting on the second one, and thus the deadlock can, can happen there. So, um, so the solution that, that would prevent uh, deadlocks is to use a second semaphore to be the attendant, um, or you know, the, they call it the room here in this example. So notice we, we, we start that off at five or at four, um, if we have uh, uh, um, five places at the table, but we want to limit it to only four processes or four places at the table at a time being allowed in there. So if we, if we start the office four, the first four that try to enter the room will be able to get in, and then the fifth one will be blocked where it tries to wait on the room somewhere there. So that's that's how this is working, basically. So you first have to get into the room, get it, get to the table is what I was describing it as, uh, before you can then try and pick up your resources and start using them to do your work there. Um, All right, so yeah, I think that, that was all I was gonna maybe kind of say about that. But um, like I said, there might be a question on the Dynamics philosophers, so I didn't want people to be surprised by that. So yeah, kind of understand what it is. Um, so like I said, you know, um, unlike the the readers, writers, and the producer consumers, it's another example of, of using mutual exclusion mechanisms in this case to directly also uh, uh, address 
deadlocks in the system and prevent them from happening. So. All right, um, I think um, I'm gonna kind of open it up for questions here, see if anybody wants to ask them. I don't think I've actually got anybody joined us live here. So did you have anything you want to ask about or review? Yeah. Let's see here. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna end the, the 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 Zoom session here. I'll post this as usual. So as usual. Um, I'm not too certain if, if we'll have much of anything to to, to do on Thursday. Um, so I'll come in and see if anybody wants to ask some questions, review about stuff. Um, so um, but um, uh, but yeah, mostly covered most of the stuff uh, to talk about review. And maybe I could start working on the unit four stuff on Thursday a little bit too, so we'll see. Um, all right, so that's it for the session. I'll go ahead and stop it. Uh, send questions if you have them. I'll see you guys later then.